Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Superlative Podcast. My guest today is Johnny Garrett, and he is the founder of William Wood Watches. Johnny, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on. You know, you were just telling me that you have a YouTube channel, and you you know you make watches, and obviously the, the watch brand is your primary thing. What is your YouTube channel all about? So my YouTube channel is called The Mentor I Wish I Had. Over the last eight years, I have been building a, a British luxury independent watch business, as you say. And uh, I've built up all of this knowledge and I took the, the brave, let's say, leap of faith of going from a corporate job working in Britain's largest bank into becoming uh, a, an entrepreneur. And I think there are so many people around the world who can resonate with that. So the channel is basically set up to inspire, motivate and mentor people who are in corporate jobs considering who have that burning desire to pursue uh, an entrepreneurial job. You know, it reminds me of when I first started uh, doing what I do with a blog to watch. Most of the blogs, this is 2007, most of the blogs were about blogging. And I just thought it was so hilarious that all these blogs out there were just about blogging. And that yeah. a relatively small number of blogs were not about the practice of, of blogging or making money blogging or some type of how to code or design a blog. But there was so much blogging about blogging. It was so meta. I just thought it was funny. It, it is it, it is a funny one, but isn't it funny as well how on social media now I feel like we're just bombarded with people who are trying to teach things of some sort, but I don't know. I, I think that comes down to challenges in the schooling system, and I think people are realizing they have to self-educate themselves now with their own skills, you know, to really be able to make it. I'm amused at the amount of people that want to be, I'll just use the term guru because guru, they really don't have an education. And yes. the question is, does the world need this many consultants, <laughs> right? Like, are there so yeah. many clients out there? <laughs> All these people willing to pay for consulting. Exactly, exactly. And I also think they try and sell the dream, don't they? Where literally it's like the, like the four hour work week, you know, where you pull your laptop out, you're on some Hawaiian tropical beach, you're having a cocktail, the Mac opens, it shuts after four hours, and you just you just live the life. And it, it, it's not like that, running a business, is it? No, God, no. I mean, I actually like working. Like, saying a four-hour yeah. work week, that sounds awful. Like, <laughs> no. I like burning energy. I don't like sitting and staying, yeah. having nothing to do. I don't like sitting still. So for me, being able to work all the time is great. I think the dream is, and this is what I hear from folks who envy kind of like what you and I do, is that we get to do something we like. And that yes. seems to be the di big differentiator, whether you're working, doing something you don't like or for a cause you don't like, or you actually kind of enjoy the fruits of your labor. A hundred percent. But I think, I think people are searching for two things. One, as you say, their fulfillment to find something that they actually love and somehow get paid for it. And then also freedom. You know, if, if you can decide where you are, who you do it with, and when you do it, that is total and complete freedom. And I think that's really what people are actually searching for. So the William Wood brand, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, but is is fireman person themed, right? It's a it's yes. a more more specifically British, of course. Yes. But it's a it's a fire person themed watch brand. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So so William Wood was the name of my late grandfather. Uh, he served in the British Fire Service for over 25 years. Uh, he was a massive role model in my life. Sadly, he passed away in 2009. Oh, my um, God. Really, my grandfather died the same year. No, man. Seriously. Yeah, 2009. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's, uh, I mean, I'm sure you'll agree as well that grandparents were just built differently, you know? Oh, they he was just, my hero. My grandfather was totally same. my hero. Absolutely. I mean, the way, what they've been through, everything they've seen over their tenure of life and and also, I really feel for my grandparents because imagine being born when they were and seeing everything that they did. And I mean, my grandfather served in, in two different wars and then became a firefighter. Um, it, it's just remarkable. Things like mental health, et cetera, didn't even exist back then. Um, but if my grandfather was around now, I'm sure he'd be very proud because every single one of our watches has his name on the dial. Every watch is dedicated to him and firefighters internationally. They're made from genuine upcycled firefighting materials like this helmet up here, Ariel, behind me. I see it. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't I thought fit that my was head. for the, uh, the gladiator pit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Are you not entertained? <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. And uh, that helmet there, we take into Hatton Gardens in London. We melt it down and we pour the residual brass inside of every single one of our watches. So there's 100 years of history inside of every single watch case. 
Um, and then Can I ask you a strap- question uh, Go ahead. on the topic of fire helmets? I have noticed around the world that one of the most ornately and weirdly designed things out there are uh, fireman helmets, whether you're in America or England or Japan. Um, these are far more than functional helmets. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe you know, why? W- what is this weird thing about fire people having to have the coolest helmets anywhere? It's, it's a bit of a battle, really, isn't it? It's, it's like... That is their symbol of how cool they are as a but fire But you can't intimidate in the country. flames. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But also, I mean, brass melts. So that, that's not a, exactly like a, a practical thing to wear in a Oh, in a I didn't fire. think they were using those anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, I mean, it's so beautiful that you think it might have been a bit of a fashion show, as you say, to be like, look, look how cool ours is. Um, I mean, there's, there's been an evolution of helmets. It went from brass uh, it then upgraded to, to cork. So cork you'll find around the 1970s. That also then, sounds flammable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> comfortable, again, another, uh, sound resistant, highly flammable. <laughs> yes. And then finally, we've got um, a, a, a plastic form, a fiberglass, which is used today. But as you say, they're all different from fire department to the fire, fire department. And also there's patches, you know, especially in the U.S., each individual station has their own patch and they oh. are very, very proud of the patch because they have the opportunity to design them. So here in California, a couple of years ago, I got thinking about the fire department and firefighting and firemen in a way that I hadn't maybe ever. And what got me thinking about it, it was driving on the free one, freeway one day. And I don't know if you remember this, there was sort of a period of time where like most of California was on fire, right? Yeah. Yeah, so course. I'm driving on the freeway and I see off into the distance, uh, not too many miles away, maybe 20 miles away, uh, and this is at night, fire in the hills. Okay. And I go on to the relevant news sources and there's no mention of this. And I'm like, am I seeing this before the news is covering it? And yes, I was actually seeing yet another fire before it was being widely covered on the news. Wow. And I recognize something interesting, that this fire, if allowed to move naturally could very easily burn my house down. Yeah. I was in the way of flames. And just a couple of years earlier, I went to uh, uh, someone's house that was in an area where there was a fire. And okay. what's so interesting is the, the whole neighborhood was affected, but not every house was burned down. Based upon mm-hmm. the position of foliage and, and flammable things, some houses burnt to the ground, other houses next door entirely untouched. Yeah. And this house was on one of those streets. Their house, thankfully, was one of the untouched ones. But just a few doors down, there was a completely burnt down house, and the street was littered with burnt down houses. And so between these various experiences, I, all of a sudden, especially as a homeowner, was mm-hmm. just suddenly realizing, oh my gosh, this sort of protection force that sort of like no one ever thought about, take for granted, and you get annoyed when you see their trucks, you know, on the street, yeah. like is very important for our safety. We're happy taxes go to it. And I started to wonder, does society celebrate this this job enough? Are they paid well? Do they have a, you know, like, uh, are they good people? I mean, there's so much talking down about the police. No one says anything about firefighters. And I found to myself, yeah. I don't know anything about this body of, of professionals. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we, we find ourselves in that situation, don't we? Um, when it comes to, to, to first responders and, and taxpayers' money. I mean, I, I would say that I don't believe you become a firefighter for the money. You, you do it for the for the love the helmet, of the yeah. job. You do it for the helmet, exactly. Yeah. Let's be honest. Um, and, and you do it because... At the end of the day, you, you want to save lives. But also, I would say it's probably one of the most active jobs in the world, Ariel. I must admit, when you see a firefighter, you don't see many out-of-shape firefighters because they're doing training drills constantly, like seriously. Even when there's no fires, they're out doing training drills. And we see that in the UK, in the US, and in Europe as well. But what you're talking about there and, and wildland fires is a real, real problem. You know, I think a fire that wasn't talked about enough um, if I was to say to you, what was the most tragic fire that happened in the U.S. in the last hundred years? What do you think you'd say? The most tragic in the U.S. Man, we have said so many, so many fires. Yeah. How how can you boil it down to one? Gosh. Yeah, yeah. So if, by fatalities, the most tragic fire in the whole of the U.S. happened in Maui recently. 
Oh, that really? Seriously. And this is the thing. It didn't get the coverage needed um, because there were some major fatalities that happened there. Oh, they and totally screwed that, screwed that up. I remember reading yeah, all about that. I heard sure, the hearings man. on it and it was like, they followed procedure, but the procedure was dumb. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that a lot of big celebrities as well have been pulled, pulled into uh, the public forum as well because they have holiday homes there, people like Oprah, The Rock, etc. Um, and uh, we, we just thought that something needed to be done about something like that. So you'll see on International Ocean Day this year, we produced a, a one-of-a-kind Maui fire watch, which is going to be put up for auction. And we know that a customer is going to bid at least £10,000 to open the bid. And we're going to give all of the funds back to the Maui Fire Relief Fund. And, and it's just, it's such a shame, you know, because there should have been a lot more information gathered and a lot more media around that kind of incident. But at the same time, let's be honest, there was a lot of things happening all around the world, including two wars. Yeah. Um, so let's let's take it back to the, the watches a little bit here because there's so much to say about that. I mean, we could talk about firefighters endlessly. Um, and at the time, just going back to my conversation, I had investigated a little bit. I was like, is anybody making watches for firefighters? Are there fire-resistant watches? Because I think that we sort of like nerd out about like space-resistant watches and water-resistant watches, but like something which is actually going to be in the line of, of harm is a potential timepiece worn – on a firefighter. And yeah. and I'm curious, is there is there something that's what you would say is a fire resistant watch, fire resistant strap? Does anything that exist? No, is the is the easy answer because wow. at the end of the day, fi- fire is extremely, extremely dangerous. And I mean, even when you're just toasting marshmallows, when you get too close to your fire, you you, you can sometimes see the power of it. When you're locked in a room and there's a raging fire there. Uh, it's a scary, scary situation from what I've been having to teach my son about fire safety. You know, kids are like naturally okay. interested in it. So I've spent like a lot of time like lighting, you know, fire outside, like you know, just showing Good. the basics, how to put out a fire. So like, I, yeah. I'm with you. I was a total sort of pyromaniac. Most kids are, come on, let's be honest. Yeah, and I yeah. thankfully didn't yeah. have any accidents, but like I learned enough to teach my son what not to do. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I think you guys as well over in the U.S. had a character called Smokey Bear, is that right? And Smokey um, Bear educated kids in school on fire safety. Usually it was like a character in posters, and you were kind yeah. of confused about why they needed to go that length to, to talk about forest fires. I mean, look, the thing is, you know, is it though that only you can prevent forest fires? I think the funny thing was also, also most of the time, only you can make forest fires. <laughs> like yeah, every yeah. one of them, it's like a human started this or or some type of implementation. It's rarely like, yeah. oh, yeah, lightning struck and that's what did it. Like it's like, oh, power lines broke. So I think the message needed to be flipped around of like only you start forest fires. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, so I, I live in south of France. I lived in London for the last 10 years with my wife. And Do you have a different uh, animal mascot? Uh, we don't, I believe we don't have an animal mascot, I believe. Ah. Um, but I'm sure, I think that was something more in the, the sort of seventies, eighties and nineties. And now they're trying to teach it more through actual firefighters as, as the hero. But we have acorn trees here and genuinely it gets so hot in the heat waves that naturally the sun will create a fire and the acorns explode off the trees as almost like fiery grenades. Cool. And when they pop, when they pop off, they then spread the fire even further. Not so cool. these tr- these trees are all, all around south of France, and, and they can just pop off and cause these, these terrible fires. But talking about what you said earlier, I mean, I 100% agree. We, we've been saying this for the last eight years. There are watches for the military. There are diving watches. There are watches for astronauts, watches for racing car drivers. But in, I mean, the, the, the British watch industry. It's the forgotten profession. Come on. Yeah. And, and I don't understand it either. I've come to the <laughs> same conclusion. It's so weird. Yeah, me too. Me too. And, I, and Is I've it that hard, folks, to make a fire-resistant way? Rolex, do you have the patents already? You can <laughs> make watches that. that go to the middle of the freaking earth, but can you make one to resist fire? Yeah, I know. I know. And we, we get asked that question a lot, actually. And I think we have started testing it. And if we master it, what we will do is just produce one watch, prove that it's done, because it's it's very expensive area. You couldn't you couldn't mass produce flame resistant watches um, because of the temperature that obviously the, the material burns at. Come on, we just, restart we meal we prices. Absolutely. Well, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Quite possibly. <laughs> I, I, I think one of those would burn in a fire for sure. Oh yeah. yeah. 
Can you make another YouTube channel where you just burn watches and just show people what happens? Oh my god, that Let's would be quite, quite funny, wouldn't it? Melt watch, yeah. Melt watch. Yeah. Maybe we're onto an idea there. Yeah. People would you donate watches, it. You'd have some type of an oven, and it would just slowly, or you could actually time lapse it, right? So you just speed it up, and it just slowly kind of melts. You could absolutely, and then a people would watch that. In, people the would day. watch that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure. I'm you sure. could also explode a watch. I think people watch that as well. Well, we are we are considering um, doing some footage where we put a watch, uh, we lock a watch in, and we blast it with uh, a full capacity strength fire hose. Uh, we try and take a firefighter axe to it, and we just show how durable it is. So go back to the research on the fire-resistant watch and strap. Where are we with that? What do you have to do to the crystal to make it so it doesn't, I don't know, char? Like, what, you know, what, tell me, talk about it. Yeah, very, very difficult at the end of the day because things like 316L stainless steel um, grade material, that, that does melt at a certain temperature. Um, sure. uh, so, so, so that's not going to withstand fire. So what we're constantly trying to do is come up with different, much more durable materials and metals which could withstand um, the, the melting capacity of, of Ceramic, fire. obviously, is extremely heat resistant. Yeah, of course, of course. But it, difficult to be able to access at a larger production volume for an affordable price. Obviously, when you're approaching manufacturers and you say, I want to make ceramic-based watches, it's, 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 it's a, a more challenging conversation than stainless steel, bronze, I DLC, et cetera. Um, but it's been, it's been quite a fun process. It's just something that we have on the sidelines there, something that we've been working on over the last eight well, years. Well, let me ask you this. It sounds like there are some options out there at higher price points. Uh, you know, again, this is a luxury industry, more expensive than the average William Wood watch. But just off the top of your mind, what would have to be the retail price of a relatively seriously, you know, flame-resistant timepiece? I think we're looking at about 25 grand. Still. Okay, that much, that much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then what, what, what comes into there as well is um, obviously the infrastructure of the company and, and the financing structure. So something that we're proud of is I, I was an ex-banker. I did that for, for 10 years. I jumped ship and, and set up my own, my own company through William Wood. And we, we've built this aerial without any debt, without any investors and just reinvested profits. So questions that we get asked quite a lot are things such as do you use in-house movements? And obviously, we don't. We, we use Celita, we use Ronda um, for some of our more entry level watches. Um, the ones that so, what's, this, what's the response to that? Because I'm guessing that's a consumer and uh, they're just like, trying to think of important questions to ask. It may not even mean the world to them. They just you know, want to see that you're serious. What is the diplomatic way of saying no, but? The diplomatic way of saying it is that we are, we are a private, family run company. Um, we have to allocate our resources, our finite resources, and really think through every investment that we make. To be able to produce an in-house movement, it takes, let's be honest, millions of pounds and years of investment to be able to get there. For no um, competitive advantage, really. <laughs> exactly. But, but that, that's, that's exactly the thing, Ariel. And I, I've seen it time and time again, and I'm sure you have as well, where companies have taken that leap of faith, invested, really impacted their P&L, and you sort of think, well, that there are there are awesome watch movement manufacturers out there that can produce Swiss made uh, movements, which can fit all of the watches that you produce. Now, if you are trying to be a big player in the market and you want to compete with the big Swiss luxury guys, and then let's be on, and you have the deep pockets to do so, then it, it it could be an option that you consider. But it's just if you really want to compete in that echelon. I mean. What I've noticed, and you probably way more so than me because you're right there selling products, is a lot of customers, before they buy a watch, they feel like they have to ask some questions and they don't even know what yes. to ask, but they just yes. feel like, I got to make sure that this is serious. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's like they're watching other YouTube videos that are honestly not the most intellectually focused. I'm like, what to care about in your first watch. And they just have these weird checklists. And I don't even think they know half the time what is they're talking about. Like, do you, do you encounter this? All the time. <laughs> Especially at trade shows. You know, at trade shows, I find that really funny because the watch is in your hands, you know? So when you're asking about like, I mean, yes, these are very important measurements. But when you're asking about the lug-to-lug -lug and it's already on your wrist, I mean, surely you can see 
how, how it sits You're on your wrist. You're asking for measurements? You know? That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, it's 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 quite bizarre. It fits I think, great, but what's the dimensions? Because if it doesn't fit yeah. the numbers that I was told, I'm taking yeah, it yeah. off. Yeah, they're like, oh, I love I love how this sits on my wrist. And then you'll ask the lug to lug, we'll say 49 and a half. They go, oh, I don't have a 49 and a half in my collection. Not sure anymore. Not sure. Well, <laughs> it's on your wrist. You're loving it. What should, what should they be asking out there? Talk to people when they're talking to someone in your position. What are the right questions? Well, for me, I mean, I've built an entire business on on storytelling, on uniqueness, on upcycling. Ask the questions that define our company and make us, in my opinion, one of the most unique watch brands in the independent space. Tell me about your grandfather. Tell me about the, the journey you've been on over the last eight years. Tell me the process of upcycling. How on earth do you get a piece of fire hose into a luxury watch strap? What's the process for taking 100-year-old British brass firefighters' helmets and putting them inside of the watches? Any of the specs around water depth, thickness, lug to lug. I mean, we, we all know that the water depth on most watches these days are going to be at least 100 meters. And that's another funny one, isn't it, Ariel? I'm, I'm a, a, a advanced paddy qualified scuba diver, almost rescue diver. I almost, excuse my French, crapped my pants when I went further than 30 meters. You know, that's when that's when it it's starts scary. to get scary. It's down. scary. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, isn't it, when people say, oh, I really need a 300 meter water resistant watch. I mean, you start to go, you start to turn into um, a lunatic at 70 meters, pulling out your, your air piece and everything. So it's, it's, it's quite funny, the whole thing. Yeah, but you can blame the Swiss because they mastered an art out of like charging more for more water resistance to make people think it's cool. <laughs> yes. When it like yes. doesn't matter at all. Uh, and they have this like weird system of like, oh, no, 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 we can't. That's 200 meters. We can't, uh, it can't be that good, you know? Like, they, they just, uh, th that one over there costs more, 300. Like, they, they make, they make really like a weird psychology out of it. So I think they confuse consumers on purpose. Yeah, but a, a big problem that we have, and I'm sure so many companies have this, is <clears throat> one of the most popular reasons for a watch having to come in for repair is because they've jumped into a swimming pool or had a shower and left the, the screw down crown open on their watch. And as much as we, say within instruction manuals and have big warning signs to always close the crown. Uh, that must be one of the biggest reasons that watches have to go into, in for repair because water's got into the watch and it's it started to rust the inner components. I actually love those little features where there's a color system or some type of indicator that lets you know that the crown is out. I think those are actually quite useful. Cool. It's very, very cool, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. So you go to a lot of shows. Um, yes. And, 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 and talk about this part of the business. And these are watch, I don't want to call them, they're, they're consumer events. There's a couple of brands who have tables usually. And uh, you have your watches there and people come by. Uh, how important is this? This is a relatively new phenomenon. I don't think it necessarily existed uh, when you started your brand. Um, you know, for how important is this, and, and and where is this this going? Is this is this because there aren't stores out there? Is this a new phenomenon? Is this meant to replace something? I just love your opinions on these um, uh, small small gatherings of watch brands. They, they are popular at this time for sure. Uh, definitely, I think that they're, they're instrumental in the industry. Um, we've been doing wind up watch fair for about three years now um, in San Francisco, Chicago, and New York. And, and I think to be fair, that, that event has played a part in the US now becoming our biggest territory. As a British independent watchmaker, you would assume that the UK will always remain our biggest home market, but it's now actually the US. And I think that's because people have the ability to be able to get hands on with our watches, be able to learn more about our story and, and really see just how awesome the craftsmanship is of these pieces. But also it, it's the type of people who come aerial, you know, that they are wanting to learn more. They, they want to be educated on the brand. They normally have a big collection already of the big Swiss luxury brands. And they've realized or been introduced to the independent industry and think, this is cool, man. Like, I, I really want to get involved in this and, and, and support independent businesses at the same time. Uh, yes, I've got my, my, my Rolex, my AP, if they're lucky enough, maybe, maybe a Patek or even an RM like we talked about earlier. But um, I'm just loving this independent space. And it's interesting you say about retail because, yes, it is filling a void for customers being able to see watches in person. So we are one of th four British watchmakers who are now stocked with watches of Switzerland Group nationally in the UK and the US. Um, and that's that's an awesome step forward for us. But you have to be in a situation where you can 
give away margin to these retailers, obviously, um, to be able to have access to their infrastructure and bricks and mortar for people to try on your, your watches. So these shows give you the ability uh, to be able to, I guess, cut out the middleman and go D to C. So is that the natural progression you as a brand begin by going to these shows and then eventually you get into retailers and you leave the shows behind? Or is the sort of retailer a supplement? The retailer is a supplement. Um, still, still, the lion's share of our revenue comes from sales through our website. And, and I do definitely want, want to keep it that way. But I think to be taken seriously as, as a player in the industry now, Let's be honest, there's still a lot of people that want to try a watch on before they buy it. And, and sure. I think that's completely understandable. How do you scale participation in these shows? Uh, I mean, let, let's look at it mathematically. You have to <clears throat> run the brand and, you know, do other stuff. Um, you can probably feasibly go to maybe four a year, and that's even kind of a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. But to do uh, ongoing business, to, to increase volume – you not only need to go to multiple events per year in the same city, but there's cities all over the world. Um, it is very, very quickly approaching the point where you probably can't go to any more. You may have already hit that wall. How do you mm -hmm. scale this? Do you hire salespeople? Do these shows provide their own salespeople and you just send products? Um, what are your opinions on, on, on the future of this? Because I see you and a lot of other entrepreneurs in your position uh, quickly becoming fatigued based upon yes. an unrealistic travel schedule and how many things you need to do on the same, you know, the same day. Love, love that question. Have you been seeing the dark eyes of founders <laughs> after all of this traveling and shows? I, 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 am, I am cursed with the ability to look very long term. And so when I see yeah. any type of business thing, I analyze it and I ask myself, What's that going to be like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? And so I see yeah. I see where all the roadblocks are going to be often. You know, it's a real dilemma. And, and we, I mean, we didn't even talk prior to this call, but you've actually even hit the numbers on the head. We do, we do four shows a year, one in the UK, three in the US. And, and we, I can't physically do more than that. Um, and I do think it's important for the founder to be there for the big important shows because at the end of the day, it's got my grandfather's name on the title and there's only one person who's going to be able to feel that passion and that emotion and present the brand as, as, as best as possible. Yeah, no and one's going to sell me. the brand as good as you, right? Exactly, exactly. And and that that is the dilemma is when you hire sales representatives to go to shows on your behalf, will the passion and the enthusiasm and the love for the story that you're trying to tell really come across because we are now considering um, shows over in Asia. Asia is a relatively new market for us. Um, the UAE as well, we, we have a lot of um, really loyal customers over in the UAE. And really all we've been concentrating on is the US and, and the UK. So we are talking internally about making hires to be able to send them over there and do the shows on our behalf. And the shows do can provide you with staff. So, for instance, at Wind Up Watch Fair in San Francisco, I'm going to be doing a podcast about our new Dunkirk watch, which has pieces of a boat that saved over 600 lives off the beaches of Dunkirk. And when I do that podcast, they will be giving me resource to be able to have on our stand um, to, to sell the watches during the time that I'm going to be, be doing filming. And it's really kind that they do that because, as you know, I really, you, you really are swamped at these shows. The shows themselves, how have they evolved since you started to do them? And, and where are they hitting certain points? Because I also recognize that the more that brands go, the more efficient they want to be for them. And uh, it becomes very difficult for the show uh, hosts, if you will, to make money, right? Because it's <laughs> really nobody wants to make a profit. The venue wants to charge them more and the exhibitors want to pay less and less and less. <laughs> so yeah. they, there's a squeeze on them. Uh, do you see them noticing that? Do you see them uh, dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, I think the shows that we do, they do, uh, they do an awesome, awesome job. Because if you think about it, you've got to make two people happy. You've got to make your vendors happy at the end of the, the event, but you also need to make sure you actually get the general public through the door and that they buy watches. A lot of us aren't just going there to, for brand awareness. It's great, but we do need to sell watches because at the end of the day, we're flying transatlantic. We have hotels. We're bringing staff over. So, yeah, you want to be able to cover the cost and obviously make some back at the same time. And we are seeing that as the brands evolve or the shows evolve, Venues are getting more spectacular and bigger, and they 
obviously cost a lot of money because the location right. is fantastic as well. It needs to be an awesome location. What, what I'd also say is, is as it gets a more popular show, more brands attend. Now, in my opinion, if you are not going to a show as a brand owner and looking to present your brand in the best possible way and tell your story and sell your heart out, what are you doing there? Because a lot of brands might be upset at the end of these shows that they maybe haven't sold as many watches as, but you can't just expect a show to provide thousands of people coming through the door and they're just going to buy your watches. You really have to grab attention. It's a performance art. It is. It's a performance it art. And, and we all know the, the, I'll call them the studious watchmaker, might have mm -hmm. a great product, good mm -hmm. value proposition, but the guy is just sitting there yeah. staring at the floor. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I get it. He doesn't want to bother anyone. He wants people to just come and look at it. But that's that's not how it works. I mean, no. I, I think the UK and the US in the Western world, I don't know about the Eastern world, are the kings of the marketing culture, right? Yeah. We know yeah. what it takes to get consumers' attention, and it is a performance. Mm -hmm. It's not subtlety. Mm -hmm. It's like in-your-face entertainment, Yes. All right. Yeah. And you and I probably grew up in various contexts where there was a human being in a public area trying to encourage people to buy something. Like we saw yes. what it took. And yeah, it's the absolutely. same thing with watches. And, and, and what's interesting is sometimes the consumer is design agnostic. It's not that they don't have taste, but that's not what they're looking for. They're not like, I got to buy this size, this color, this style. Yeah. They're looking for something to make them feel good. They're looking for a story that they can repeat, right? And I think what's great about like a firefighter's watch is that immediately if somebody compliments it, you can just like blurt out a bunch of information, like easy. And that information yeah. comes from you, sir, right? You yes. have to give it to the consumer. They then have to convey it to someone else. Me and media, I act as a liaison between the really big brands that don't really have the ability to speak directly to consumers. But it's all the same thing. It's the, the, the transfer of a story. You must form the story, make sure it's compelling, and then – give it to them in a palatable way such that they want to repeat it to someone else. And that's exactly. really what you need to do with the shows. Nailed it. Because our customers become our biggest sales ambassadors. They go into their friendship groups and they go, guys, let me retell the story that I heard from the mouth of the founder of this watch company. And they'll literally go like, smell this strap. It actually smells smoky because it's been used <laughs> in real fires all around London. You know, and people are like, wow, that's insane. And, and we find people even come to our stand genuinely and go, okay, sell to me. Like they literally go, sell it to me. And then, and then that's, that's when obviously the performance begins. And I think, I also think that as your company grows, corporates, big corporates are trying to become more human. And the smaller businesses, the humans, are trying to become more corporate. So as a company grows, they think that it's important to start talking about how many countries they're in, their revenue, how many watches they sell. But at the end of the day, what the end consumer wants is human to human. And I think people lose that connection when businesses become too big. That's why I'm not threatened by AI, because I know that humans are looking for other humans. And no matter what you present in front of them, they will be skeptical and be like, is that, is that from a person or is that a machine? Me um, too. I want to change topics now to something I'm quite interested in, and that, that is, what has the experience been like dealing with the firefighters and their organizations? Yeah. Obviously, I know through charitable donations, of course, buying this surplus old equipment and things like that, um, you've obviously wanted to interact with them as much as possible. What was that like from the start, and what is that like today? The evolution has been really interesting because back in 2017, when we started out, the majority of people who bought our watches were firefighters and first responders. It was about 75%. Uh, now it's flipped on its head almost exactly to 75% watch enthusiasts, 25% firefighters and first responders. And I think you can understand that because the easy marketing approach from the beginning was to target the audience that the brand is inspired by. And then when people realize, oh, this is actually, this is a proper, well-crafted watch, which could fit nicely in my collection. And people can resonate with the story, not only of firefighters, but also with my grandfather. I, I think people could, could then connect to that. But, uh, you know, when, when I kicked this off, I didn't realize how far into firefighting we'd go. It's absolutely insane. We almost play a bit of a, a vocal piece 
certainly in the UK, in the fire service now. So when a firefighter comes to retirement, there is normally a few different products that can be purchased for them um, to, to thank them for their service. One is a plaque which has their name engraved onto it and an axe. And it says, thank you for your 25 years of service. The other one is normally um, a, a medallion or a coin or a medal of some, some sort, which again, they would put onto their, their mantelpiece. There's also wallets, which are made from upcycled fire hose. And we have luxury watches, obviously made from upcycled firefighting materials. So we've actually become one of the main products that a firefighter will actually be purchased or acquire for themselves when they come up to retirement. We didn't realize that we play such an instrumental part in the fire service where to commemorate someone's career, they will literally purchase one of our products, which is really, That's really great. cool. We've also um, produced watches for many fire departments around the world, Ariel. So we produced a watch for the New York City Fire Department. We donated $25,000 back to the FDMI Foundation as a result. We've done the same for the London Fire Brigade, Kuwait Fire Force, Melbourne Fire Brigade. The list goes on and on and on. On top of that, we've even made watches for unions. So the actual trade unions that represent firefighters when there is some kind of uh, indecision or, or, or challenging question that needs to be answered. We've even produced watches for the union uh, with wow. their branding in the back, which then goes out to, to all firefighters. Um, so It's so kind of start- amazing how all these groups out there, doesn't matter what it is, it's an active profession. They want watches with their names on it. I've never quite understood it, but it's amazing to me. It's cool. I mean, they're very, very proud at the end of the day to be able to own a watch that has one, the crest, the emblem of their local fire department pressed into the back, and two, their payroll number put into the back of the watch as well. It's a, and then for the watch to actually have the materials in it that they use every day, it's pretty wild, you know, because also what we've tapped into as well is that generational handing down of watches. Firefighting normally is passed down for generations. You 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 genuinely do see grandfather, uh, father, son, normally many generations. So what happens is those watches get handed down to the next generation. And um, we're even considering releasing a line of children books uh, where my grandfather is the character in the book, William Wood, and he tells children how to be courteous, kind, polite. And every single drawing in the book has a sketch of a William Wood watch on his wrist. So obviously when they become 18, what's the first watch that they want to buy? A William Wood watch. Because children I, have an affiliation to firefighting. You're thinking well. about getting them young, huh? Get them young. <laughs> 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 so I've always been interested in what maybe they want in a, a tool watch. You know, we have brands who they'll make watches for the Navy SEALs and last them or soldiers or whatever. Um, are there complications or the materials or their functional requirements? Like, I'm sure you've had these questions. Like, what do they say would be useful to them in the field? I'll tell you what's useful to them. An Apple watch. <laughs> I don't think that's very fire resistant. It's not very fire resistant at all, but uh, there's a crazy What does it do for that. them? Is there, is there an app for them? <laughs> <laughs> well, a third, a third of all firefighters in the UK wear an Apple watch because it's such an active and fitness job, fitness related job. They okay. want to track that the heart rate. They want to track the, the stairs climbed when they're doing their training activity. Uh, they just want to track the distance when they're going for runs, etc. So they're like, they're like fitness data nerds. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And you know, that's been a big problem of ours is not only are we trying to sell a beautiful watch crafted from the materials they use every day, but we have to educate them to make them realize, guys, you can have a digital and an analog watch, okay? Don't just think that the only thing on your wrist can be digitally based. Please consider investing in Well, they need something for date night. They need something when they have the suit. Like, they, these guys, they'll know real quick that the smart watch doesn't go well with a suit. And they need to wear formal attire once in a while at least. There's that, I call it the 20% rule. You know, 20% of the time, you're going to want something other than the smart watch. Oh, definitely. But... Trying to trying to get your brand out there to the fire department in any country in the world is like trying to turn an oil tanker because a lot of the fire service has a, let's be honest it's a public sector body so as you'd expect it's it's bureaucratic bureaucratic there's a lot of red tape and it's traditional so they're not get, open-minded get, hippies <laughs> <laughs> so when I come in with an entrepreneurial idea it's like whoa 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 so sometimes genuinely the best way to market to a firefighter is pinning a poster on the station board of every station for them to physically see that pinned 
leaflet. That's how sometimes traditionally you have to go with your marketing approach. So you haven't got them to admit that there's anything that they want in your, they're like, no, we're not going to wear it during a fire. It's too nice for that. Like, you know, there's no, there's no like tool watch conversation with them. No, not, not really. Um, okay. A lot of firefighters do wear our Valiant collection in fires. They've, sit, they've said that it's come out without any kind of problem. In That's fact, good. a lot of firefighters never even take our watch off for any call out and they haven't had any issues at all. And they say that it hasn't even heated up, which is, which is awesome. Um, but obviously we wouldn't recommend it, uh, but they just don't ever want to remove the watch from their wrist. Something that we do say is obviously they can use the, the bezel of the watch to be able to measure how much oxygen capacity they have left in their watch. And because it's unidirectional, it means even if they hit the bezel, it's not going to go backwards and knock off that vital oxygen supply um, measurement. But then again, that's just the same as, as a diver would for their tank on the, on the scuba diving. Interesting. I, well, in a few years, we'll have to pick this conversation back up and see what else. Because I imagine that you're working on certain things, searching out materials and stuff like that. I've yeah, always even always. thought, you know, that the strap, at least have a fire resistant strap. That's easier, right? That's There's materials for that? Well, yeah. I mean, o- already we have an upcycled fire gear strap, which is made from the jackets and the trousers that firefighters wear in fires. Um, so, so that that element would be fire resistant. The problem is, is to make a strap which is made fully from upcycled firefighter materials is very challenging because it doesn't have a rigid mold to it. So what we do is we have a rubber backing, which is the the strap mold, and then we stitch into the rubber backing, the upcycled piece of the material. We've tried making straps fully from that equipment, but then at the end of the day, it's a firefighter jacket. It was never designed to be made into a luxury watch strap. It's, uh, and this is where actually some of the luxury comes in. It's the processing, right? It's how to take these materials and to process it into something uh, both beautiful and effective. And that's, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's what every brand needs to do. So I remember, I think I received your very first watch. It was like a dress watch, the two-hand one with the big Dauphine hands. And that was a decidedly, you know, dressy product. Obviously, you've come a long way since then. I mean, how long ago was that? Was that that was not a decade ago, but close to it? Close to, man. Yeah, that was eight years ago. Eight years ago, um, I remember thinking that that the packaging was very impressive. Like, this is a guy that wants to make a good impression. Um, yeah. And the brand today is obviously like well more fleshed out. You have a lot more stuff going on. But I want to know. Where was the turning point? You had this initial product. Maybe you eventually squeaked out um, a sports model. But when was the point you're like, wait a minute, you know, this this firefighter watch thing, like, this is going to be a real thing. Like, I can, I can run with this. I can pin it down to a month. It was December 2019. Okay. That was when we launched our first mechanical option, which was the Valiant Collection. But also that was when we announced our upcycled fire hose straps. Our fire hose straps are obviously a big piece of our offering and they're really adorned by customers around the world now. And really what we're known for as well uh, and what stands us apart in the marketplace. So when we coupled those two things together and then what happened was COVID came about. And when COVID came about, where other brands were potentially fearful, we invested heavily into social media marketing. And the business really took off to an extent where we didn't really fully know how big the company was anymore. Like what, what is a true normal year um, of, of watches sold? Um, because as we, I'm sure many brands have talked about this, uh, perversely to what the news was saying, people weren't spending money, they weren't going on holiday, they weren't buying that coffee, they weren't commuting into work. So they had disposable income to buy a luxury watch. Um, and it, it took some time you know, after COVID to really know what the true performance of the company actually was. So it was that mechanical movement with the fire hose draft coming out in 2019, leading into COVID, and then us really going hard with investment on uh, digital marketing. And, and, and that was like significantly um, the turnaround point for the business. I want to talk about design a little bit. Um, now, for the most part, the watches don't scream firefighter or fire. You do have some playful models, I believe. I haven't looked at them all that do that. But, you know, from an aesthetic designer standpoint, there's 
like the right and wrong way to lean into the firefighter theme. Yeah. Um, you could get really cheesy really fast. You get yes. really gaudy and untasteful, boring. There's just honestly when it when it comes to celebrate anything I watch, there's more wrong dis- directions than right directions. Yes. Where where does the discipline need to be? What are some of the right moves to incorporate the theme and what have you found are some of clearly the wrong moves to incorporate the theme? Well, one of the main questions we have written on the whiteboard when we're having our sort of brainstorming sessions or design um, conversations is uh, you need to ask yourself the question every time, is it, is it too che- cheesy? Is it too cliche on every decision we make? Because at the end of the day, we're trying to be a luxury watch company inspired by firefighters. But if you go too playful and you go too firefighter themed, it's a very, very narrow line that you can take. And I think, oh, yeah. I think we've done it in a very tasteful way. But I must admit, what, one of the, I remember I met with a, um, a designer once and he said, once you've, once you've locked in your design, the last question you should tell yourself or the last action you should do, remove one more thing from the design. Even if you think it's a perfect design, remove one more thing. Then you've hit the subtle, understated luxury tone, which I find quite interesting. Um, and this is a conversation that, that we have, we have constantly. Now we like to be playful. We like to play into our concept. Uh, the most recent watch that we've released only just last weekend at the British Watchmakers Day in London is a watch inspired by the fire exit sun every single day of the week. It's a day wheel. And every day of the week, Ariel, from Monday to Sunday, is the fire exit sign man carrying out a different action. So he's literally like late for work. He's commuting into work. He's like, thank God it's Friday. And it's like the fire exit man, which is really cool in the day wheel. And then the back of the watch has a disc. And it, 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 it's, it's inspired by when you were looking at a flip book in school and you draw a figure man and you'd flip through the pages and he'd run. Or when you spin the disc through the fire exit door, the man literally runs away from a fire. Now, that's probably the most playful watch we've ever done, but I still think when you look at the watch, it, it, it's a real wow, elegant watch without being too um, cliche. Moving forward, how do you maintain that? I mean, obviously, you need to break new ground, and you said something interesting was that more and more of the customers are not from the firefighting profession, which means that to, to appeal to some of them, you have to push the theme a little harder than you might have to push for a firefighter. For example, I always say like a Superman watch is for two people. If Superman was wearing it, he doesn't want like his face on the dial or name. He wants something else. But other people might like that. And so yeah. similar thing, like a lay person might need to see, you know, some firefightery thing. But an actual firefighter doesn't want to be reminded of any of that. Yeah, of course. It, it's, it's a really, really tough one. And, and we see straight away once we launch a watch, which customers that it's within their interest area and which ones it's not. Some of our customers say, we want to see more colors, more vibrancy, more craziness. And then there's other customers who want to see more subtle tones, more of a luxury, luxurious um, execution. And, and it's, it's a real predicament. We, we don't have a, cook, a cookie cutter customer. So what we're trying to do with that fire exit watch, that that was us stepping into a more playful arena, and it's actually gone down like genuinely amazingly well. And I, I think that watch as well has had the most amount of buzz we've ever seen on social media. Um, I think we, we, we grew our social media following in the last nine days by about 30%, you know? And, and, and a lot of that was based on the the fire exit watch because it grabs attention let's be honest when you see a man running away from a fire it grabs attention um but the the true stat to look at is has the watch sold through and it's sold through very nicely um so we have lots of future uh, ideas we've also started working with an with an independent watch designer now so the last eight years of models were designed in-house now we're actually working with an award-winning british watch designer um and that's been really fun to take ideas in my head and actually give it to an expert now. So the green watch is what we'll call an enthusiast watch, right? Because you need to understand a little bit about watch culture to sort of get it. And 
what I think is is correct about this, and again, I, I say this to you and others that are in this in the space where you're trying to have a um, a medium sized entrepreneurial brand, right? When, it's like when you're smart and, and and starting, sorry, young and starting out, it's easy to to sort of get by. But once you've sort of been doing it for more than five years, like it becomes a hard thing to do. And mm -hmm. what you need to do is you need to have a core collection which sells to we'll call it a broader base, like some type of customer that you can sort of repeat to. But then you need to make sure that people are talking about the brand and that there's um, what we'll call like expert validation. And so mm -hmm. the limited edition or playful or enthusiast watches, whatever you call, you have to sort of create those in addition to the core collection ones to make sure that the um, you know the watch lover intelligentsia uh, is talking about you and saying good things. And so yeah. the reality is you actually have to mix this somewhat complicated assortment of watches, sometimes at different price points even, um, that appeal to a variety of members in the ecosystem. Uh, you can't sell to everyone, of course, that's impossible. But like, I, I think it's a mistake if you just sell to one. Like you always say in, in financial yeah. investments, diversify. If you're selling to one narrow niche of customer, uh, that could be good for you, but you're you're putting yourself in a very precarious situation. Definitely. Yeah. You've literally explained our business model there. We, we have a core oh. collection, which brings people into the brand. We can nurture them through the core collection, normally over a few years. Um, and then we release two limited edition drops every year. The limited edition drops are to make sure that William Wood watches are front and center in the media, in the press, and, and also it attracts either a new audience or appeals to the sort of more out there kind of audience. So that that is literally how, how we operate. Now, this is an interesting thing because you have this firefighter theme brand and you agree it's successful, but you're going to have this creative itch, right? And at some point, you're going to want to make a product that has nothing to do with it. Are you going to go the route of starting yeah. to seed other brands so you can have you know more creative interest? Because I see, I see the creative side of you. I see you like that. And I think you intuitively know, don't ruin the special sauce by putting in the wrong ingredient. So are you going to make more dishes? I think you're in my brain. I don't know how you're answering, asking these questions. These are all things that I've literally considered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, listen, it would be very easy for us, wouldn't it, to be able to go, okay, let's just now do police. Let's just now take upcycled police materials, police SWAT team tactical unit jackets, or let's do uh, paramedics or mountain rescue or the lifeguard carry over my grandfather's story because firefighting and first responders are captured under one umbrella and just hit a brand new industry. <laughs> the challenge with that is I think it starts to lose the integrity of the brand and the sole mission and what, what we're all about really, which is trying to inspire the luxury watch industry to know more about firefighters in an industry which, let's be honest, never talks about firefighters because it's luxury. Um, we're also trying to give back as much as possible to firefighters. And at the end of the day, that was my grandfather's profession for the last 25 years. When people say, how far can you really go with firefighting? My answer is, there's, what, what is there, 190, I think 196 countries in the world. Every country oh, you has can a go fire. Really far. That's, yeah, that's, every, that's a bad question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, every country has a fire service. Um, but even on top of that, everyone can, can connect and, and resonate to my story. Have I thought about stepping out of the field over the last eight years? Yes, of course. Um, there's a famous guy uh, who runs a very big business called Charles, Tr Tr Charles Tirrett Shirts. They're lovely oh, yeah. shirts. Yeah. He, he acted as a bit of a mentor of mine and... Um, well, as he was growing his business, he was he was he had a, a a flurry of a few years where he was being very successful, and he thought that it would be good to set up a children's clothing line. So he set up a, a line of children's clothing, set up his own boutique, I think, down in in the West End of London, and it, and it failed, and it took a lot of his money, and it took his attention away from the main business. I think what happens is entrepreneurs get complacent, think that they're doing really well within their industry, maybe get a bit bored and think, let's try something different. And a lot of the times it doesn't work or you take your eye off the ball of, of what your focus really is. Now, for example, Ariel, there are, there are very natural ways that you can bridge the gap into another industry. And I'll give you an example. 
In May of this year, we are launching the most important watch of our company's history. Okay, it comes out on wow. May 26. There is a London Fire Brigade fireboat which sailed over the channel four times with 13 men and rescued 600 Allied troops, British and US soldiers off the beaches of Dunkirk, bringing them back to the UK alongside 850 other little ships. These little ships were fishermen, um, just basically civilian boats. I saw the movie, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Crack, cracking movie, yeah. Um, this boat also rescued my favorite building in London, St. Paul's Cathedral, that epic cathedral. It pumped the water from the Thames during the Blitz. A missile was dropped on the cathedral and it got the volume of water needed to the firefighters to save the building. The most crazy fact of them all is our National Health Service, the NHS, was created on this boat, <laughs> which is just mad. The founding wow. members of the NHS went to Parliament, asked for a secret location to discuss the blueprint of the NHS. They were locked on this boat, or given the boat from the LFB, they locked the doors, all sat around the kitchen table and sailed up the Thames and actually created the National Health Service. There's documentary evidence of it. What we're doing is we're creating a watch that takes the original pieces of the engine from the 1940s that actually sailed over to Dunkirk, putting it inside of the watch. We're using upcycled fire gear straps. Every single watch will have a unique number between 1 and 600, which commemorates the 600 lives saved by the boat. Anyone who buys the watch will physically have their name engraved onto a plaque that goes on the boat to sail over the channel in 2025 to commemorate the 80th year anniversary of World War II ending. Okay, so it's like an actual piece of history, this thing. Now, people the reason people tell love you, it when, when you put stuff like this together. They love this stuff. A hundred percent, man. I mean, but the reason I'm telling you this, why? Because in eight years, this is the first time we've ever bridged the gap into the military in a natural, synergetic way through a London Fire Brigade fireboat. Interesting. Interesting. I, I, I also recognize, especially in the UK, these types of inspirational stories are needed right now, especially as institutions yeah. need some revitalization. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's a bit of a tough, tough place at the minute. That's why we're thankful that the, the thing is with the US is, is it seems like the US is more insulated to economic downturns where people work so hard that they do want to spend their hard-earned money at the end of the day on things that they appreciate and they love. Whereas in the UK, as soon as people hear negative news, it's batten down the hatches, cancel two holidays a year. I'm going to consider purchasing this watch 18 times and I'm going to speak to mm. everyone in the family before I think about doing it. And mm. it's a really tough industry in the UK, I'll be honest. Interesting, interesting. Uh, this actually segues to sort of my, my last area of questions, and I think we'll have to have another conversation again to, to keep talking about stuff. Um, but this is with pricing, and you're right there on the ground. And what's great about a brand like yours is you're extremely sensitive to anything related to how a change in price can affect business and the sentiment of the consumer. It's not that you can't change prices, but like you really know what happens, and you know how they respond to prices and things like that. I am very curious to know where certain types of things will settle. And that is like your, your upper middle class person who's buying an enthusiast luxury watch. What is their, what is their threshold? They're spending somewhere between about $500 and $3,000 on average. But that's a pretty big range. I know that for a while, the just under $1,000 price point was very popular. Then it was just over $1,000, right? Where where do you think this is going to go? Because I think that we're still a moving target, and there's no right or wrong answers here. And this is really just your intuition. But I think you'll agree, first of all, that prices is a moving target. And if they are to settle any time, where are going to be the categories? Like, what is going to be some of the sweet spots for this this large audience that we're talking about that wants to spend a certain amount, but certainly isn't going to spend more than that? I love the topic of pricing as well. Um because I think sometimes it's a race to the bottom. And I think sometimes as well, the enthusiast is driving the wrong behavior, you know, like yeah. comparing brands. This watch has this movement. Why are you charging more? Well, does that, and my, my answer is normally, well. And what is the lug to lug distance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Because um, my, my, my question normally back to them, Ariel, is like, okay, go and find another watch that makes 
uh, timepieces made from upcycled firefighting materials. Oh, there isn't one. Okay. So we set the pricing, you know? Um, so when it comes to pricing, I think, I think the trend right now is around 1500 pounds or less. Okay. I think the, and that's, uh, sterling. Uh, I think about two years ago, it was under a thousand pounds or maybe even closer to 500. There was a real craze around trying to get really, really affordable. I mean, that's a very difficult pr- uh, price point to operate in. Mm-hmm. Um, set of, set of price points there. I think it's driven by, so for instance, I think a, a good acid test here is country. When we do shows in the UK, the customers normally are drawn to our watches that retail for around 800 to a thousand pounds. They don't even consider our Swiss made Krono options at two and a half K. When we go to the US, Normally they start at the chrono at two and a half thousand pounds and don't even consider the watches under a thousand pounds. And it's really, it's genuinely strong in the evidence when we see the sales, when we do these shows. The US seem to go for the higher price point and don't even sort of flinch at two and a half thousand sterling. But in the UK, as soon as they get that price point, you can actually sometimes see the person recline and go away and go, no, that's, that's not for me. So it's really interesting, isn't it? The difference in behavioral mentality to prices. Very interesting. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, Johnny, tell people where they can find more about you and, of course, the William Wood uh, brand on the Internet. Yeah, for sure. So uh, our website is williamwoodwatches.com. Our Instagram handle is at williamwoodwatches. Um, if anybody also wants to check out the YouTube channel I talked about earlier again, um, that's called The Mentor I Wish I Had. Uh, but yeah, hopefully they enjoyed the conversation. I've certainly enjoyed it, Ariel. And I think, as you said earlier, it'd be great to have another one in the future. Likewise, this has been the Superlative Podcast interview with Johnny Garrett, founder of William Wood Watches. Johnny, thank you so much. Thank you.